I'm very proud and pleased to introduce, this is a scholar that's been around in our field for a while, but I think this is his first time here at the round table. So I'm particularly happy that Dr. Gahn is with us. So I just want to read a couple of lines about uh, Joseph Gahn, and you get a sense of who he is, and then uh, welcome him up here. Joseph Gahn is a cultural clinical psychologist, and he explores in his interdisciplinary scholarship the intersections of evidence-based practice and cultural competence in mental health services. As a citizen of the Gros Ventre tribal nation of Montana, he has specifically investigated these issues through collaborative research partners in both reservation and urban indigenous communities in the United States and Canada. He's a graduate of Harvard College and the University of Illinois, and he taught at the Department of Psychology and the Program in American Culture at the University of Michigan for over a decade. And he's published 40 articles, more than 40 articles and chapters addressing the cultural psychology of indigenous community mental health. And he's done this fabulous online, I actually made it available to my students. He does this wonderful uh, exploration of science and how it um, collaborates and does not so well with work with indigenous and traditional ways of, of thinking and being. It's really very, very powerful. He's also received two national awards as an emerging scholar in his field and was appointed as a residential fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. And so I'm very pleased to welcome, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gahn. Well, I'm really glad that you uh, found uh, the stamina to make it to the end of the conference and attend one last uh, session here. Uh, I'm going to figure out how to enlarge this first. There we go, good, okay. Let's start with a little bit just about my own interests and uh, what I bring to this talk today. I am an academic psychologist. I think someone was talking yesterday about how important that is to clarify sometimes because in the public, psychologist means you're a psychotherapist. And so I am a research psychologist. However, I'm trained clinically, um, even though I continue to engage in community-based kinds of projects uh, that focus on culture. My interests are broadly in culture and mental health, but more circumscribed around indigenous psychologies in particular. Uh, it's important to say psychology is plural because indigenous peoples are actually quite diverse and you need to be pretty specific when you talk about some of these things. And um, my interests run into the applied direction, particularly around mental health stuff, as you'll see today. I have four things that I want you to get from the presentation by the time we're done today. The first is to learn a little bit about the mental health context for American Indians in the United States. Uh, the second is to contemplate the case for uh, integrating psychotherapy and traditional healing for these populations in mental health services. Uh, the third is to complicate that project, to appreciate some of the challenges and difficulties in trying to do so. And finally, to impress upon you um, what I consider to be a really important direction uh, to go in, which is to cultivate indigenous therapies very deliberately in trying to uh, uh, undertake mental health services for American Indian communities. So let's start with some brief stuff uh, and by way of background, and then we'll be able to get into the meat of what we're doing today. American Indians and Alaska Natives, or indigenous peoples of the United States, are the surviving uh, descendants of uh, a number of uh, communities that were in existence prior to European contact. Uh, there really was quite terrific diversity among these peoples um, uh, that, that rivaled um, Europe in all kinds of ways. 40 language families here versus maybe four in Europe. So a great religious diversity. So in many respects, um, quite an interesting place prior to 1492. Um, but, of course, colonization was a cataclysm for indigenous peoples, uh, primarily from disease and then, of course, from all sorts of other violence and dispossession. And so when you had a uh, pre-contact population of over 5 million estimates, vary quite a lot depending on which demographers you talk to, um, that dropped precipitously over the ensuing centuries to a mere 240,000 by the turn of the century. Um, but that's rebounded again, so uh, with a pretty high birth rate, um, you now see on the U.S. Census of 2010, uh, 2.9 million Americans identifying as American Indian. Um, if you include folks who added Indian along with some other racial identification, then you end up with 5.2 million. So um, you could say, well, it's back to where it came from there. Um, 
American Indians uh, are organized according to federally recognized tribal nations. Um, this is a fairly complicated history that yielded treaties um, and that were signed and uh, reservations created and uh, a nation-to-nation -nation relationship established with the United States government. And so that all is organized and harnessed through tribal federal recognition. Now, one question you quickly get uh, when considering these topics is who is an American Indian in the United States? And it really does depend on how you define us or how we define ourselves, which is contestable. So there is a problem with self-identification to some degree. Um, as I said, five million Americans identified on the census as being American Indian. Um, but of course, then if you say that those who identified only as American Indian alone, that is without another racial identification, that drops down to three million. And then if you consider the members of the 565 federally recognized tribes, then you're down to closer to two million. Um, there's no one number that any government office anywhere can point you to to say, here's how many tribal members there are. No one keeps that information in any tallied form. So, um, but two million is a pretty good uh, guess as of uh, 2012 anyway. Um, but the interesting, uh, interesting thing about American Indian identity is that uh, it, we need to talk about it beyond the racial ideology that has structured how we often think about ethno-racial identification in this country. Um, uh, we're, first of all, Indians, as members of these federally recognized tribal communities, um, are actually enrolled members or increasingly were thought of as citizens of these tribal nations. So it's not just a question like it is with other uh, ethnic ancestry groups in America of who you claim, it's also a question of who claims you. And so often um, this can become uh, at a point of debate when particular people lay claim to Indian ancestry. And moreover, it's not just about American Indian tribal identity, uh, it becomes an issue of citizenship within these polities, these tribal nations. So it's not just ethno-racial identification along the lines of what you often see, but it's really a political status that's been carved out in a very unique legal history based on these treaties, sovereign nations, et cetera. So the important take-home point from all this is that uh, American Indian status in the United States is one in which you have um, uh, recognition of tribal sovereignty uh, as polities that are able to do certain things that nations are able to do. And there's also a history that has resulted in a federal trust obligation. That is, the federal government has responsibilities and made promises and has to follow through on those promises to take care of and, and help manage Indian resources and so on. This applies also to health care services. So the uh, federal government has a branch of the U.S. Public Health Service called the Indian Health Service, which is responsible for all health care on uh, reservation settings, um, so uh, it leads to a very distinctive service ecology when it comes to mental health for most tribal communities. It's federally funded, it often is federally administered, although increasingly tribal governments uh, take the federal funds and administer health services on their, on their own. You won't be surprised to hear that American Indians suffer from mental health disparities. There are epidemic levels of distress in many of these communities, reservation communities, uh, and urban communities where there are um, collections of uh, urban migrants uh, from reservations. Um, and particularly, this manifests as high levels of substance abuse and trauma. Um, and uh, alongside that, unfortunately, the mental health services that are available in Indian country are really underfunded and therefore not adequate to meet this need. So there is a large unmet need for mental health in Indian country that we need to recognize as the important backdrop for what I have to say today. So with that background, I want us to move into the case then for therapeutic integration. I'll say a little bit more what I mean by that and why I think it matters. I just mentioned there's a problem here, that is that there's pronounced mental health disparities alongside of very underfunded mental health services. And so you would think that that would lead to a pretty obvious solution. Why not expand mental health services? Then the unmet need is met and uh, the problem is solved. Well, it's not quite that simple. And, and the reason it's not quite so simple has to do with the history of colonization, which has really uh, altered uh, Native communities, uh, defaced Native communities, na Native communities in very profound ways. Um, I'll talk about the problem of cultural difference, in which you have to recognize that Indian communities were uh, historically distinctive cultural enclaves prior to contact and colonization, and that even uh, through uh, centuries of colonization, persistent cultural practices continue to endure today. I say cosmology, I say ethnopsychology. Uh, what do I mean? Well, cosmology, I'll give an example from my own people, the Grovant, a Northern Plains people. Um, who, are, one name we have for the supreme being is uh, the one who controls all through the power of thought. And part of our cosmology, and, and not just ours, but other plains peoples as well, is that 
thought by a personality, whether it's a human or other than human, is actually generative in the world and can bring the world into alignment with what is desired through wish or hope. And uh, so the supreme being controls everything through the power of thought as, if you will, the supreme thinker. That's cosmology. Now the ethnopsychology that follows from that is uh, Grove want people recognize that we as humans also have a very attenuated power of thought to also change the world. And so this is why um, in, among our people there's a certain amount of reticence communicatively about certain kinds of topics because some things are not appropriate to think, aggressive things, hateful things, and they're certainly not appropriate to express verbally because Grove once understood that you could kill each other through the power of thought. So there's a sense in which this ethnopsychology is tied to the cosmology and has persists despite all kinds of dramatic changes that are visible to anyone who sets foot on a reservation. The main point here is that the culture of the mental health clinic is not the culture of the American Indian community. So there is this problem of cultural difference when it comes to clinical service delivery. And it's not just that these cultural differences can meet on equal footing or have a nice exchange of information or approach, it is also uh, inflected through this history of cultural dominance. That is, colonial domination was one that obviously was most interested in dispossessing native people of land and resources, but then was left with a whole subject population that was taking up federal resources and people in the, in, in the taxpayers and citizens didn't know what to do. So um, they started an education civilization movement under the slogan, kill the Indian, save the man, in order to try and integrate native people into society, albeit at the lower socioeconomic tiers. Um, and these power asymmetries endure today, and so the problem of cultural dominance hasn't gone away, although um, federal Indian policy has ebbed and flowed in various ways that were more or less oppressive in this regard. All of this, I say, leads up to what I call a post-colonial predicament. First of all, I put post in parentheses because in a settler colon, colon, si, si, situation of settler colonization, it's not exactly clear what post-colonial looks like uh, because the settlers aren't going home, they're here. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so we live uh, among people who conquered us or their ancestors, some of whose ancestors participated in our conquest. Um, so post-colonial or not is debatable. At any rate, the point I'm trying to make is on the one hand, there is an urgent community need around mental health kinds of uh, difficulties. We live in impoverished, high-risk settings well beyond what is, um, I think, morally uh, uh, justifiable. Um, and there are these documented disparities in mental health status that everyone can point to and that are talked about uh, in, even on the news or the New York Times. On the other hand, the clinical services that you would think could be made available to meet these needs are actually incongruent in various ways. And uh, this particular cultural incongruence of mental health services is attested to by anecdote. Um, Native people will tell you that. They'll choose not to go to psychotherapy even though if it happens to exist on the reservation and they feel like they need help. Um, and also by some evidence that shows epidemiologically that Indian people are more likely to prefer traditional healing and traditional healers for their mental health problems in comparison to psychologists, psychiatrists, and other forms of specialty mental health professionals. Well, obviously the uh, call for cultural competence, which you're all very familiar with um, here at this uh, meeting, um, is something that's meant to kind of help address this problem. So professional psychology's remedy for what I've called the post-colonial predicament would seem to be cultural competence. Cultural competence, as you know, is a reaction to the monocultural bias in the profession, uh, an effort to counter racist invalidations of vulnerable clients within psychotherapy settings, and an effort to tailor psychotherapy for the culturally diverse. And if you're not familiar with this exact table, you certainly are familiar with these uh, items that appear here grouped under beliefs and attitudes, knowledge, and skills that a culturally competent psychotherapist is presumed to have or to cultivate. Well, one thing that's interesting to me about those uh, knowledge, skills, attitudes is um, that there's explicit reference to traditional healing in there. Attitude number eight says that, that a culturally competent therapist respects indigenous helping Practices, skill number seven includes can seek consultation with traditional healers. And so it's interesting that traditional healing kind of makes an appearance there. Actually, if you step back and think about it, traditional healing can really be seen as the quintessential form of culturally competent therapy. It's the place that you might want to go to the degree that you can find um, them persisting, uh, these traditions persisting in a given community, because there you can attend to the principles and approaches that might be harnessable in some way for a more kind of... Uh, uh, culturally nuanced and re resonant psychotherapy that could help people more effectively. 
And so there seem to be lessons to be drawn for professional psychology from consideration of traditional healing. Moreover, there's a, a history now of an effort to actually integrate aspects of cultural practice and traditional healing into psychotherapy. Um, dating back to the 70s, you can find the literature in psychiatry and mental health of uh, professionals like psychiatrists who are interested in working with medicine people in tribal communities right in the health system to try and uh, deal with um, uh, mental health problems. So this is not really new. It's been around for decades now, although you can't really learn a lot in these articles about the how-tos and the why-fors and all that. They're just gestures or um, summaries that these have happened or been attempted, but the details are not really published. Um, Gene Thin Elk in the, 90, in the 1980s in particular developed what's called the Red Road to Recovery, which is an effort to look back to Native tradition to recover from substance abuse. And um, talked about this in inspirational lectures all around Indian country. Uh, my own gra uh, grandfather was really touched by this at that particular time when he was recovering uh, from alcohol problems. So it's really um, uh, had an influence. Um, Laframboise, Trimble, and Mohat published this really important article in the Counseling Psychologist in uh, 1990 um, calling for therapeutic integration of traditional healing and psychotherapy for American Indians. And of course, you're probably, probably familiar with Eduardo Duran's work, what, what I'll call soul wound psychotherapy. And um, in some of my own work, I've uh, worked in settings where um, indigenous communities have tried to uh, figure out how to integrate traditional practices into various forms of therapy and treatment. So, Therapeutic integration is not only called for, makes sense to address in terms of responding to the post-colonial predicament, but is uh, even uh, being undertaken in this way as, as we speak. What I want to suggest, however, is that it's not exactly easy or transparent as to how one would go about integrating traditional healing practices and psychotherapy. So let's get back to basics first and foremost. What is therapeutic intervention? Some of you may have encountered Jerome Frank. Um, this uh, is maybe a fourth edition written with his daughter that I'm citing here, but he's wrote about psychotherapy for many decades now and talks about psychotherapy in a way that's meant to be at a high level of abstraction and that has uh, constituents that you can see across all variety of therapeutic traditions. So according to Frank, the four constituents of psychotherapy are that you have an emotionally charged, confiding relationship with a healing person, all right, emphasis on a relationship, you have a healing setting, that's a context in which healing is expected or understood to occur. You have a rationale, conceptual scheme, or myth that provides a plausible explanation for a patient's symptoms and prescribes something to be done for resolving them. So there's some kind of expectation of how and why something that happens should make a difference. And finally, you have a ritual or procedure that requires this active participation of both patient and therapist, and that's believed by both to help out. These are the four constituents that Jerome Frank laid out as uh, defining, in many ways, uh, psychotherapy. And it, as you can see, he was trying to be deliberately inclusive across various therapeutic traditions, not just the modern psychotherapies or professional psychotherapy, but what he called, quote, religio magical healing as well. And if you think about those four constituents, you can imagine why they could be broadly construed across a wide range of therapeutic traditions. So if healing and psychotherapy in the modern sense share these commonalities, what's the problem? I mean, why can't you just integrate them, put them together, and solve the post-colonial predicament in that re respect? Um, well, I think the problem has to do with whether we choose to focus on the commonalities or focus on the differences. As you know, in psychology, we have so-called lumpers and so-called splitters. Lumpers are people who put things together based on their common properties or features and, and see things um, as going together, versus uh, splitters who uh, tend to the nuance of di distinctives distinctiveness and differences and uh, say, no, no, these can't be the same. They're really different because of these characteristics or attributes upon which they diverge. So whether we emphasize commonalities or distinctions, it's important it has implications as we think about how to put together professional psychotherapy and American Indian healing traditions. So I want us today, at the heart of this talk, to consider a, um, a bit of comparison in that regard to see what we can come up with here. To do so, I just want to give you a background on how I'm thinking about professional psychotherapy and what some of its features or attributes are. Um, I'm particularly talking about psychotherapy as it's existing today, increasingly um, monitored uh, or um, uh, supported through market forces in the era of evidence-based healthcare. 
So there's older traditions of psychotherapy. You can think of humanistic traditions and so on where you know, no insurance is going to pay you as a therapist to get that done, and as a consequence, they're not nearly as prevalent as they used to be. But I really am just sort of thinking at this evidence-based moment on to what degree psychotherapy can be characterized. And I think some of the characteristics at this moment include some of the following, that there really is a standardization of approaches or techniques, that is, there's an effort to say, you know, uh, as an insurance company, we will reimburse a therapist for doing these kinds of therapies. And usually the therapies are paired disorder by technique, or technique by disorder kinds of therapies, like uh, ex exposure and response prevention, f prevention for obsessive compulsive disorder, and so on. Um, efficacy is understood to be tied to the technical mechanisms of the therapy. That's why it's te technique driven, and that's why it's technique by disorder, is because you know, the therapist is essentially inter understood to be interchangeable. I don't care who the therapist is, as long as you know how to do exposure and response prevention for obsessive compulsive disorder, then we will be happy to pay for that technique because that's what efficacy is tied to. So therapists are understood to be roughly interchangeable, at least if they're competent and trained in the proper technique, it should be no problem who does it. Therapist expertise, then, is comprised of a few things. It includes some attention, of course, to research findings, uh, there's different ways that we're all trained in terms of whether we actually have to produce research or just consume research, but research findings are at the back of, in the background of any professional activity, and psychotherapists um, today are not an exception to that rule. But a good part of it, of course, is technical know-how. Again, it's back to this technique, it's back to are you trained in how to do a particular kind of therapy, um, can we trust you to do it? And in particular, can we throw any number of clients at you with the right kinds of problems, of course, but expect you to be able to work with that client uh, to be able to help, help them out using this technique? Recognizing that everybody's a little different, everyone has their idiosyncrasies, but basically, with this technique, you should be gifted or skilled enough to be able to tailor the technique at hand to the client's um, needs. In that regard, then, fidelity to technique is really seen as more important than the client tailoring aspect of it. In some ways, the client tailoring is the afterthought. You're considered trained if you know how to do the technique. And any therapist should be able to do the client tailoring bit. It doesn't require the same kind of expertise. Overall, then, I'm saying that the, the modern uh, psychotherapies as practiced within evidence-based healthcare really places an emphasis on technique over relationship, the technical over the relational. Now, um, of course, we're all aware that there is some debate about the nature of the therapeutic relationship versus technique and so on, and that's interesting to return to, but I think uh, in terms of how healthcare market forces work, the technical is, is certainly winning over the relational argument on that front. So let's consider now um, what I wanted to get to for this talk, um, really at the heart, it are some features of American Indian healing traditions. We can start with asking, you know, who is an American Indian healer? So one thing I try to do in uh, giving this kind of a talk is to ask people in the audience, who do you consider to be the most uh, famous or influential American Indian healers that you've heard of in the 20th century? Obviously not 21st century, 20th century, there's a long period of time there. Anyone have a candidate in mind? American Indian healers that you're familiar with or you think that would be the most famous? Any ideas? Well, um, let me suggest, just in some ways for fun, that one we might consider would be um, the Reverend Oral Roberts, who is known for televangelism all around the world, and who is very proud of his Choctaw and Cherokee ancestry, and who is a faith healer. He, goes, he started off in tent meetings and revivals, so he's a Christian faith healer, right, who became a televangelist. Um, um, now, I say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek, uh, just to throw off your sensibility of what uh, Indianness and, and, and healing might be, because... There's a sense in which, or Roberts, to the degree that we accept he's native, I mean, there's a sense in which that's debatable, I think. Um, and yet, he was honored by the American Indian Exposition of uh, Oklahoma as the Native American of the Year in a given year and so on. So it's not just what he claims. There are others who are claiming him as well in that respect. Um, but, you know, what we consider Indian and what we consider healing are not stable and static. Things change, they flow, they mix, they, they, there's hybridity, etc. So that's one reason, I think, to bring up Oral Roberts. Um, but really probably the one that I would nominate as the candidate um, that you probably at least have heard of is Black Elk, um, uh, who, whose Lakota name is Hehaka Sapa. Um, I'm going to talk about Black Elk in a little bit more in a minute. In my own work that I've done um, uh, publications on, it's been a healer, a Grovant healer named Bull Lodge, who my great-grandfather um, wrote a lot about in the 1940s when he was employed by the Works Project Administration to do that kind of thing. 
But I'm not going to talk about Bull Lodge so much today, other than to say that um, the traditions that Bull Lodge followed and the traditions that Black Elk followed and the traditions of a case study I give today are different tribes, but they're all Northern Plains people, and they really do share a good deal in common. So what you learn from them in terms of their tr traditional practices is not all that different. Let's talk for a moment about look, uh, Black Elk. Um, anyone read Black Elk Speaks? Not read Black Elk Speaks, my goodness. So um, you definitely would read that if you take a course in, in a religious history in America, um, Indian studies courses of various kinds. Um, it, it also may be um, a particular historical moment has come and gone, I'm not sure. Um, but Black Elk Speaks is the creation of John Nyhart, who was a white guy who was a, a, a poet laureate and interested in doing the great American um, uh, epic poem. And so he contacted Black Elk on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Black Elk was a Lakota man and worked with him uh, to talk about Black Elk's vision. Um, Black Elk was born in the 1860s. Uh, he was a survivor of the Wounded Knee Massacre, uh, grew up on Pine Ridge, um, and interestingly enough was um, stalked by the thunder. Um, which is to say that at the age of five, he, looked, he was out hunting, playing with a little bow and arrow, trying to shoot birds, and a, he had a vision of some people in the sky uh, when a thunderstorm was rolling in who told him some things. And uh, he said he wasn't asleep when this happened. It happened as he was awake playing, and he was very struck by it. Uh, when he was nine, he got sick and had to go uh, to, to bed for several days, upon which he was sort of in a different state of consciousness for, I think it was 12 days, and um, he had his great vision nine years old, and the rest of his life was spent trying to work out what does this really mean, what, does it, what is its purpose, what was its significance for my life. And um, but he became a, uh, basically uh, the way this worked in Lakota society at the time was that you, know, you didn't desire to become a healer, the powers, the, the beings picked you. And so essentially Black Elk was stalked by the thunder. By the time he was 16, he was deathly afraid of thunderstorms because he understood culturally that with uh, being a quote, thunder dreamer, it was his obligation to announce himself to the community that he had these gifts. But he was reluctant to do so because of the demanding life that that kind of uh, gift brings with it. And uh, if he didn't announce it, the thunder might strike you with lightning and kill you. So he was really in mortal anxiety for a good part of his adolescence until he finally came out, so to speak, uh, pledged the Heoka ceremony, which is how you would inaugurate this kind of practice, and started his first case of healing when he was 19. Um, he practiced healing for a number of years. Uh, the Jesuits who arrived and um, proselytized on the Pine Ridge Reservation became increasingly intolerant um, of uh, native religious practices. So a Jesuit uh, walked in on 1902 during one of his healing ceremonies and scattered his implements around and disrupted the ceremony. Uh, that man was killed accidentally by a horse fall uh, within uh, uh, some time, short time later. Black Elk, I think, took that as a recognition that he was doing the right thing. But a couple years later, another Jesuit walked in, threw his implements out of the lodge, seized him by the throat, and said, get out, Satan. And when nothing happened to this guy, Black Elk had a crisis of faith and converted to Roman Catholicism and for the rest of his life was a very devout Roman Catholic. Nyhart begged him to show him how to do <laughs> some of these ceremony things, and he would not do it. Um, the one thing he did do with Nyhart near the end of his life in his 60s is he went up to a peak in the Black Hills and did a little prayer to the four directions on behalf of his people. And when this was published finally in Black Elk Speak some years later, he had a heck of a time at Pine Ridge because he was not known on Pine Ridge among his own people by that time for being a traditional healer. He was known as being a Roman Catholic catechist. And the priests were very upset. And it caused him to at some point decide to um, sign a sworn affidavit that no, he was a Roman Catholic, this is what he believed, it wasn't you know, back to the blanket or slipping into his traditions. So you see these kind of hybridity, these kinds of entanglements, the kind of dilemmas that people can feel. Black Elk is known around the world, probably the, the quintessential Native American healer and philosopher, um, and yet for the better part of his life he was a Roman Catholic catechist. The Hioka tradition, the Thunder Dreamers, that continues today, however. And what I want to offer today as an example of a traditional healing for us to consider is from uh, this book, uh, The Price of a Gift, written by uh, psychologist Gerald Mohat, the late psychologist Gerald Mohat, and uh, his, uh, a healer on the Rosebud Reservation named Joseph Eagle Elk. Like Black Elk, Joseph Eagle Elk was haunted by dreams and stalked by the thunder and lived in mortal anxiety over whether he would be struck if he did not come out during his adolescence and pledge the Hioka ceremony, which he did, uh, and became a healer for the rest of his life after that. And so um, rather than go into the details of his life, I want to tell you something about a, a healing episode that's contained in this book. It's a little chapter called The Fish and the Man. 
And in this chapter, Joseph Eagle Elk recounts um, a healing uh, of his that confused and perplexed him for all of his life. Um, he knew a psychologist in Wyoming, a white guy who sometimes came to ceremonies on Pine Ridge, and this psychologist reported to him that he was treating a young man who had been diagnosed with terminal cancer, was given four months to live, was going through a rough psychological time trying to cope with that. And he wondered, this psychologist asked Joe Eagle Elk if maybe he could help him. And Joe Eagle Elk decided to consult his spirits. Part of what these healing involves is a form of conjuring or divination of consulting with your spirit helpers and finding out what they have to say about cases. And so he consulted the spirits, and, and Joe reported back to the psychologist, said, look, tell your friend that my, my spirit helpers spoke right up, and they said what he needs to do is he needs to go fishing. Uh, if he's too sick, go with him. It's okay if you go with him. Go fishing, and what he's supposed to do is you're gonna catch a fish, take the fish off the hook, hold the fish in your hands, look the fish in the eye, and tell the fish, I wish you a long life. And once you've said that, then say what you need to say to the fish. I don't know what that's gonna be. It will come to him in the moment. And then uh, listen, and the fish is gonna tell you something back. And then once that's happened, I don't know what the fish will say, but once that's happened, the fish may well take that cancer away once you let him go. So as Joe Eagle Elk recounts this, the therapist, the psychologist went back to Wyoming, is working with this patient. They're trying to go fishing for an entire year. They're trying to go fishing. Things keep coming up. They get all prepared, and then he's too sick. They get all prepared, and there's an emergency. They get all prepared, and they can't. Finally, they get it together many months later to go fishing, and uh, they go to all the fishing spots that the guy knows nearby and can't get any fish. So they go to a fish farm where you pay to go fishing because it's stocked with fish, and goes to the fish spot, and they still can't catch a fish. So there are these tanks where they stock fish and they breed them till they're bigger or whatever. They pay the guy and he says, look, just go fish in the tank, you'll get a fish. So they cast their line in. Soon the young man with cancer pulls up the fish. And he pulls it in hand over hand, he holds it in his hands, he looks it in the eye, and we, um, the psychologist is standing back and the psychologist can't hear what he's saying, but he sees his lips moving. He's obviously talking to the fish. And he's talking for two minutes, maybe three minutes. And as he's standing there finishing up, this fish lets out a sound. The sound is like, and the only reason I know what it sounds like is uh, Jeff King, who's a native psychologist, has heard this story from the psychologist who, in question. So he, according to Jeff King, the fish made a sound that was like, rawr, rawr, two different sounds like that. And this guy was holding it, was again, just, uh, un they were astounded. He was very happy, and he let the fish go, and they left. And um, so, the reason this stuck in Joe Eagle Elk's mind as a difficult case of healing was because um, the man, the fish didn't take the cancer away from the man. The man later died. And um, Joe Eagle Elk was trying to figure out how come it didn't turn out differently. And one reason he said it didn't turn out differently, or that he thought didn't turn out differently, was because the fish did speak to the man, but the man didn't know what the fish said. And there was only really one way to figure out what the fish said. That is what the meaning of that sound was was to come into ceremony and let the spirits explain what the fish had said. And Eagle Elk explained that, you know, you didn't have to believe. He, maybe he didn't fully believe, but he didn't have to believe. The spirits would have told him, at least he would have known what the fish had said, and maybe that would have made a difference, I really don't know. But in the end, as he tries to explain this, he says, look, it's probably because they were of two minds. They couldn't lend their full mind to the Lakota way, and uh, they were kind of also in their other way of trying to deal with this. And so it's very hard to live in that middle space and things don't work out as a result. So I think there's a caution there about the middle way, about trying to put things together, about the ways in which these traditions can or cannot sync up in ways to be maximally helpful. But there are lots of other aspects to this particular uh, kind of healing that I want to just pull out for a minute. Um, to generalize, again, to the stuff that Bull Lodge would have practiced, to the stuff that Black Elk would have practiced, and so on. Um, first of all, curing rituals themselves. Um, I certainly adhere to a broad cultural patterning. Um, Black Elk had certain ritual implements. Joseph Eagle Elk had certain ritualism. They, you know, they conduct a Uweepi ceremony where they call their spirits. That's going to be similar in many respects. But it's also distinctive, too. They're going to have some ritual objects that no one else has. They're going to sing certain songs that only they have for their ritual. They have a special healer. It's not everyone, a helper. It's not everyone's helper. It's their helper who comes to them. So there's both some aspects that are shared, but also some really distinctive aspects to their healing. The protocols um, may be standardized. That is how you summon your spirits, the ceremony you're supposed to follow to get them to come. But what results from that consultation is wide open. 
So no one's going to say on the basis of Joe Eagle Elk's uh, consulting his spirits and learning about this man that he should go fishing, that, oh, so there's a fishing cure for cancer now, or a fishing cure for depression when you're sick with cancer, or whatever it is. It's totally distinctive as to what the spirits might say to do, and it's dependent utterly on any given uh, particular instance. That curing rituals, of course, involve humans in uh, the, the, the practice and participation, but also other than humans, or we could say spirits. There's a reason I prefer other than humans, which I won't go into now, but in the exercise of power on behalf of these patients. In other words, what has to happen for healing to occur is the circulation of... Uh, um, there's, English does not help. Lakota people would say wakan has to do with life, it has to do with um, uh, what we might think of as supernatural power in the West, but supernatural doesn't do the right thing either. Anyway, a wakan, it has to do with power that is the ability, like I said, that thought gives to bring changes to the world. A powerful person is one who can bring the world into alignment with one's desires or one's wishes. And power can be exercised by other than humans who are better at doing that on behalf of humans through ritual or ceremony. Therefore, efficacy depends on the power of persons involved, especially other than human persons, rather than technical mechanisms. There's nothing technical really about it that matters. It's about summoning the right beings and having those beings be willing to uh, uh, change things on behalf of patients. And it, the summoning itself is a function of, of knowledge and power. That's what the expertise of, of a healer is. Um, and uh, healers and their other than human helpers are not interchangeable. Rather, the single most important therapeutic variable is the healer and the gifts he has, the power he has, and um, the helpers that come with him to assist in his work. So competence, really, in ritual management of interpersonal interactions with healers, ceremonial participants, family members, and these other than humans is really crucial for beneficial outcomes. And interestingly, the violation of ritual protocols, whether intentional or not, actually can cause danger or harm to the participants involved. So following the protocol of the actual ceremonial stuff is sort of important. And in our new age moment, this is the kind of thing that fades away, that there's danger uh, sometimes from these things. But older people still know this and will often um, warn you about being careful who you go see, making sure that they're vouched for, et cetera, because actually a lot of harm can follow um, for people who are malfeasant ritually. And therefore, because there's potential danger, fear is actually an intelligible response to some ritual exercises of power. Um, certainly in old school healing, um, if you, um, in my great-great-grandparents' generation, people who needed to see a healer were apprehensive about lots of things surrounding it. It's a risky thing to do, potentially. Um, so, uh, but in terms of back to comparisons to psychotherapy, the emphasis here clearly is very much, I would say, on the relational, much more than the technical. That is, it's about managing relations both among humans but also between humans and other than humans who can exercise power in this way. And technique is not understood to be responsible really for the change that occurs through therapeutic efforts. So there's a lot of different distinctions we could draw to this. The one I'll just talk about briefly has to do with what I'll call the nomothetic ideographic distinction. As you recall from your psychology training, nomothetic refers to that which is general across cases, has to do with the application to individuals really only in probabilistic terms. It's kind of statistical sorts of, of um, applicability. Versus the ideographic refers to that which is t utterly and truly distinctive to a given individual case. It's only appropriate for that case. It doesn't not meant to generalize and it um, is uh, uh, contoured to that particular case. So if we, one point of comparison we can make simply is that you know, evidence-based psychotherapy is really based on nomothetic aspirations. How do we pr produce a technique that we can generalize to help people across um, all walks of life, but in a way that you know, will hold in statistical terms, never knowing if any given one person will benefit, but knowing that a certain percentage will if you offer it to them all under the same conditions, et cetera. Versus what I'll call the ideographic, maybe even relentlessly ideographic commitments of some Indian healing practices, which are so distinctive, you can't, it's not clear how you would even standardize you know, the fish cure for cancer, right? It doesn't, it's, not how it, it's not even the right way to understand that. There's no way to generalize it or scale it up in that way. And one of the most um, important intellectual thinkers in Indian studies uh, captured this here uh, in this quote 
um, the key to understanding Indian knowledge of the world is to remember that the emphasis was on the particular, not on general laws and explanations of how things worked. Well, what are the implications then <clears throat> of these divergent traditions? Um, well, I think one interesting question to ask is can there even be evidence-based forms of Indian traditional healing? How would you undertake research that would um, be able to determine um, in a standardized fashion that whether you know, a control group is not as likely to benefit from a treatment group when there's no even ability to standardize what the treatment is exactly. Um, if, so if, if, but, but if it were possible, what's gained and what's lost by thinking about healing in this way? The possible gains, of course, are scientific legitimacy, the ability to get federal funding for programs that use these kinds of things. Um, the sort of stuff that SAMHSA funds are really important for Indian communities. Um, but you know, SAMHSA likes to fund evidence-based interventions. Um, possible losses, of course, we could refer to epistemic violence to indigenous tradition. Um, or we could say, you know, there's, there's not a way to really make this relevant, and so what is the consequences of that? Uh, or, or, or rather, um, if, if it's not possible to make them evidence-based, what is their relevance? And one, you could answer that, well, they're highly relevant, even though they're not a valuable in principle, because they're mo what is most... Um, intelligible and culturally grounded for some people in some communities. Or you could say, no, no, it's not relevant at all to what we consider to be mental health services and professional mental health because it's not a valuable in principle. Um, I'm not trying to come down on that either way today, um, but I, what, I want to do, want, what I want to do is to accentuate that there really are some important distinctions. So here are just a few that I've written about in work that I've done in these kinds of comparative traditions. Of, you know, the necessity in Indian ritual healing of ritual supplication, the relevance of, you know, again, supernatural, in quotes, power, uh, a really important regard for fortitude and vitality among individuals, which means that there's maybe a lot of reticence to express when someone is going through a rough time. Um, and to tell people, well, you need to be able to, s to spell out your needs so that others can respond is a form of cultural prescription that may not be welcome. Um, that there are construals of space and place that matter, um, that some healing traditions occur um, in near the places where the medicines can be found that were instructed in given visions. Often these visions on the northern plains happen in particular mountains or mountain ranges. Um, and there's some interest, evidence, I think, to uh, recognize that the beings who are the helpers are tied to these landforms, or maybe are these landforms. And so you could think about how could you take that away then from that part of the country? Would it work? And of course, norms governing self-expression. Um, you know, um, it's, Indians have a stereotype rep representation as being reticent, um, of being quiet, of not being particularly expressive, and. Uh, um, not to endorse a stereotype point blank, but at the same time to say there are reasons actually why communications in you know, public or non-intimate settings is something to be monitored with great care in most native communities. So in terms of complex integration, with so many profound distinctions that are inherent here, how can therapeutic integration be substantively possible? And is cultural competence, with its emphasis on therapist attitudes, knowledge, and skills, really adequate to this challenge? So, finally, I want us to consider cultivating indigenous therapies as mental health services. And I want to start by saying, uh, proposing an alternative to cultural competence. And this alternative really is about shifting our focus a bit. It's shifting our focus from the production of culturally competent therapists, that is, therapists who recognize themselves as enculturated actors, who share contingent assumptions, approaches, and aspirations about how to deal with people, to culturally commensurate therapies. Not therapists, but therapies. That is recognizing that therapies themselves are cultural artifacts that are expressive of and constituted by contingent normative assumptions from the cultural um, places in which they originate. So let's try to put some meat on the bones to explain what therapies as cultural artifacts might mean. Lawrence Kermay has written about the cultural origins of psychotherapy in Europe and what that's implied for the tacit or implicit assumptions that are embedded in the talking cure. Uh, that is that you know, the, most psychotherapies invoke a particular form of selfhood, one that's agentic rather than passive, rationalist rather than perhaps um, uh, other traditions, monological uh, and univocal in terms of the kinds of selves that are presumed to benefit from uh, psychotherapy. They presume egocentric and individualist forms of personhood, um, rather than, say, collectivist or 
um, sociocentric kinds of orientations. It relies obviously on psychologically minded, self-referential talk. And those are all cultural aspects for what it means to be a human or a person and what it means to get help that are not entirely shared around the world and are not even shared in the United States by different subpopulations. So we can contrast these with uh, various er Indian therapeutic traditions and find, for example, just in the examples I already gave, that psychotherapy is almost always secular, whereas it's not really possible to conceive of an Indian healing tradition that would not be sacred, that would not depend on religious or spiritual understandings. That psychotherapy tends to be more rational. It's a lot about how can we come up with techniques, how can we, using the powers of rationality, invent ways to help people versus this more mystical side uh, to indigenous healing in which Joe Eagle Elk doesn't even understand fully what's gonna happen, what it means, how to unpack it, how to figure it out. When you work with powers like he does, a lot of things are beyond your understanding and you, you know, do your best to make sense of it, but they're not always completely sensible to people, to humans. And finally, it's, as I said, technical versus relational. So these deep divergences and the question then is, to what degree can we harness all this into some form of post-colonial remedy when it comes to Indian mental health um, disparities? Well, the first step is simply to recognize that clinical intervention is cultural prescription. That it's not just about getting therapists to be more sensitive in how they deliver psychotherapy, it's recognizing that psychotherapy itself is a form of cultural prescription that may not be appropriate or acceptable for all kinds of people who are in distress. Um, and particularly with regard to American Indians, you want to acknowledge the danger of a kind of neo-colonial cultural proselytization. Uh, we've had our share of missionaries, and I've sometimes sort of uh, sardonically uh, noted that you know maybe therapists are, are missionaries for a new millennium in our particular communities because uh, whereas religious zealots are kind of on the downturn, um, there's a burgeoning therapeutic industry in Indian country today because of the health disparities and the way money flows through healthcare. And to consider seriously indigenous claims that, quote, our culture is our treatment. Um, I label that cat culture as treatment, the culture as treatment hypothesis. Um, that there are therapeutic alternatives that can be based on reclaimed traditional practices and that there's a holistic rationale that's grounded primarily in religious experience for why one would want to do that, and that they address not just personal distress in many reforms, but also cultural identity, which is a big issue since colonization, as well as community renewal and self-determination. So I want to propose instead of cultural competence, or beyond, not, not necessarily instead of, but beyond cultural competence, this notion of cultural commensurability of therapy in which we can see a continuum of cultural commensurability. It ranges between two endpoints. On one endpoint, you have a non-adapted professional therapy. All right? On the other end, you have an indigenous healing practice um, of the kind maybe that Joe Eagle Elk would have done for folks. Neither of those endpoints are suited for mental health services with American Indians. The traditional healing is too different, and the non-adapted isn't even culturally competent, you know, in that sense. So there, neither endpoint is acceptable. But there's this vast middle ground here on this continuum that affords all kinds of possibilities for projects of what I'll call creative hybridity. Now, the continuum, as I see it, is not about um, making normative judgments um, about, well, we're more traditional than you, or we're, we're not, we're too assimilate. It's really, it's intrinsic value is not about where it, it goes on the continuum relative to either endpoint. It's really about a function of helping community members to see that there's a range of options before them in terms of how they might creatively develop a hybrid form of integrated therapy um, or treatment or program of some kind, whatever they call it. Um, and, and the conceptual benefit lies in placement along the continuum in one place versus another. And they can sort of figure out, well, what could we do that would move it in this direction and move it that direction? What do we think is feasible and most desirable? And most importantly, then, it facilitates this broad critical attention to these issues of cultural commensurability through heightening of consciousness about it, because in many Native communities today where resources are so thin and where people don't have time, they just take what some other community is doing, boilerplate it in, and just follow suit. Um, as opposed to stopping and trying to think, well, what would we really want if we were going to be more creative and own this for ourselves? And, of course, most importantly, it helps to disentangle the neo-colonial from the post-colonial. The exact same practice can be neo-colonial that is forced from the outside or post-colonial that is adopted from the inside. There might be no recognizable difference in what is done. 
What frames it is to what degree people have been involved in charting their own way forward with regard to these activities. So, in terms of revisiting this post-colonial remedy, the usual approach in our field is to start with a mainstream psychotherapy or intervention and then culturally adapt it to a community. I mean, I often, some of these are so superficially done that I refer to them um, sarcastically as dressing it in beads and feathers or trotting it out in Indian drag. Um, but that's the usual approach that these things are to. The second inverted approach that I want us to advocate for and think about is to start with cultural traditions and then as a secondary process, figure out how to cultivate those for purposes of human services, uh, mental health intervention, and so on. In other words, I'm advocating for the creation of alternative, local, even maybe ultimately evidence-based interventions that draw on relevant aspects of the healing tradition. They're not traditional healing full, uh, in full force necessarily, but relevant aspects that are deemed useful or helpful in this hybrid creation. And I'll just close with um, a few words about a project I have going on with the Blackfeet Nation in Montana with the substance abuse program there known as the Crystal Creek Lodge. It's a residential substance abuse program, Minnesota model. Residents who are all American Indian and mostly Blackfeet come and stay for 30, 60, 90, 120 days where they get, you know, really the first five steps of a Alcoholics Anonymous or AA is what that's about. A little bit of culture here and there, but mostly it's an AA-based program. Now, it's not especially effective. Now, substance abuse treatment is not especially effective, um, and it's not especially effective with populations that are really poor and that don't have uh, places to go where substance abuse isn't maybe so rampant. So it's not surprising that it's not special. I'm not trying to single them out as being particularly ineffective. I don't think they're any less effective than anywhere else trying to do this work. But that means they were open to trying to think about other possibilities here. And so in 2008, I approached the law staff and said, you know, so you've got this kind of thing going on, and it's Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's been good for our people in lots of ways, but I wonder if we could think out of the box. What if we wanted to, like, look back to Blackfeet traditions and to figure out how to harness those to try and help people who are going through substance abuse, um, struggling with substance abuse issues? And there was a lot of enthusiasm that met with that. Uh, I started an extended consultation a year later during a summer, got some money to go out and uh, start a draft, and to, to, together with a couple, handful of key people, we put together, you know, what I kind of call a pretty radically alternative treatment. And in some ways, it's not a treatment. It's a summer cultural immersion camp that if you saw it this past summer when we piloted it, you wouldn't recognize it as treatment at all. It, there's no therapy to it. There's no psychoeducation about alcohol and drugs. There's no talk about your past. There's not, <laughs> there's not the things that they do in the treatment program really here. Essentially, it's a return to Blackfeet traditional life ways, um, a socialization into Blackfeet religious practices in particular, in which the implicit understanding is that cultural practices, especially traditional religious practices, are involved in circulating life. Um, and that this circulation of life is itself healing or therapeutic for all kinds of things. And that the kinds of things that people with substance abuse are struggling with include an, a lack of a sense of self, a referen no reference group of people who are living well without substance abuse, no purpose or meaning, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there are ways in which um, the rationale for a hypothesized efficacy of this approach um, kind of reveals itself. For one thing, um, when I first presented this to the members of the grassroots traditional society called the Crazy Dog Society on, uh, in Blackfeet, um, every single one of those guys said, oh, well, we know this works because all of us had substance abuse problems at this time or that time in our lives, and now, now we do this, and that's how we know that it helped us. When I suggested that we needed to study and research it so that we could show that it helps people, they laughed. They thought it was laughable and, and a waste of resources, frankly, to have to do that. Okay, so I've written a different paper about that and what I think about that. But the point is that they're so transparently obvious to people in this community and in many Native communities that the return tradition and cultural practice is the best way to help people who are having these troubles, that it's almost um, um, a truism. Um, there is, of course, scientific literature also linking culture to recovery, and there's a few... Um, uh, articles I'm citing here in which people have followed folks who had substance abuse problems who find culture and find ways to come out of recovery or document in post hoc circumstances the ways in which culture, quote, culture helped them. Um, and it's also not hard to imagine that people have religious conversions of all kinds in the face of crises in their lives, including uh, deep substance abuse, that transforms them miraculously, it would seem. And so the, this is really no different in that regard. Um, 
The question, of course, and I want to emphasize these are empirical questions, at least as a psychologist I feel they are empirical questions, is can you really harness this stuff? So, you know, it's one thing to have linked it in my own background, but can you actually uh, put it together in a programmatic fashion in a way that you can predict that people going through will get better as a result of it? Um, is cultural immersion enough to really remedy substance abuse, or do you have to have something about psychoeducation, something about skills, et cetera, right? Can you do it without it or not? Can development, implementation, evaluation of a culture as treatment approach compete for research funding? Because uh, this stuff costs to do. I don't live in Montana right now. I grew up there, but I don't live there. So, you know, how does all this stuff work out? So there are pressing questions, but I wanted to share with you today um, one way that I think we've been trying to make some sense of how to proceed in this regard. In closing, I just have some take-home points that I'd like to leave with you. Um, obviously, the first one is that mental health services for Indians are vexed by this post-colonial predicament, that predicament being a great unmet need but incongruent services. So what are you going to do? Second, that Indian healing traditions do, in fact, diverge in pretty substantial ways from professional psychotherapy, ways that make it hard to know how to put it together. And I'm mindful of Joe Eagle Elk's recognition that the between may have been um, what went wrong with the particular healing tradition he was practicing for that one cancer-ridden client. Third, because therapies are themselves cultural artifacts, we may need to move beyond cultural competence to really considering the actual tools that therapists use as being um, uh, full of uh, uh, embedded cultural assumptions that can actually change people in assimilative ways without their understanding or knowledge. Uh, that is to focus on cultural commensurability of the therapies themselves. And finally, to recognize that therapeutic integration entails creative forms of cultural hybridity, wherein Indian traditions are cultivated as mental health services. Uh, if you want to know more about the stuff that I've been working on, uh, I have a website where you can uh, see and learn more. And I really appreciate your time today and looking forward to any comments or questions you might have. Thank you. I think the longest-standing longest instances of this hybrid approach are in substance abuse treatment programs that are run by Indian communities. And my guess is that in Toronto, I mean, in uh, Montreal, there's going to be a friendship center, maybe even some kind of associated substance abuse program that's for the urban population there. Um, I bet they would have interesting things to share about, you know, how they brought culture and tradition into substance abuse treatment. And it's probably going to, almost always going to involve a, a, a sweat lodge. I mean, there's, there's just things that people have done. So that's where I would start. Well, at least now you've all heard of Black Elk. And maybe some of you will read about Black Elk. But I, if you're only going to read one thing about Black Elk, don't read Black Elk Speaks, because that's mostly Nyhart and less Black Elk. Read The Sixth Grandfather by Raymond DeMalley. The Sixth Grandfather is the, so more or less the transcripts of Nyhart's interviews with Black Elk, where you'll get the closer version to what Black Elk had to say for, about his own life instead of Nyhart's uh, adoptions and adjustments. You've been great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.